because you're now directing all of deep learning at DeepMind. You get to interact with a lot of projects, a lot of brilliant researchers. Um, how much variability is created by the humans in all of this? Yeah, I mean, you, I do believe humans matter a lot. At the very least, at the you know time scale of years on when things are happening and what's the sequencing of it, right? So you get to interact with people that, I mean, you mentioned this, um, some people really want some idea to work and they'll persist. Um, and then some other people might be more practical, like, I don't care what idea works. Mm -hmm. I care about, you know, cracking protein folding. Yes. Um, and these, at least these two kind of seem opposite sides. We need both. And we've clearly had both um, historically, and that made certain things happen earlier or later. So definitely humans involved in all of this endeavor have had, I would say, years of change or, or of ordering how, how things have happened, which breakthroughs came before which other breakthroughs and so on. So certainly that does happen. And so one other, maybe one other axis of distinction is what I called, and this is most commonly used in reinforcement learning, is the exploration-exploitation trade-off as well. It's not exactly what I meant, although quite related. So when you start trying to help others, right? Like you, you're, you're, you know, you you become a bit more of a mentor to a large group of people, be it a project or the deep learning team or something, um, or even in the community when you interact with people in conferences and so on. Um, you're identifying quickly, right? Um, some some things that are explorative or exploitative, and it's tempting to try to guide people. Obviously, I mean that's what makes like our experience. We bring it and we try to shape things um, sometimes wrongly, and there's many times that I've been wrong in the past. That's great, but it would be wrong to dismiss any sort of of the research styles that I'm observing. Um, and I often get asked, well, you're in industry, right? So we do have access to large compute scale and so on. So there's certain kinds of research I almost feel like we need to do responsibly and so on. But it is kind of, we have the particle accelerator here, so to speak, in physics. So we need to use it. We need to answer the questions that we should be answering right now for the scientific progress. But then at the same time, I look at many advances, including attention, which was discovered in Montreal initially because of lack of uh, compute, right? So we were working on sequence to sequence um, with, with my friends over at Google Brain at the time. And we were using, I think, eight GPUs, which was somehow a lot at the time. <laughs> and then I think Mo Montreal was a bit more limited in the scale, but then they discovered this content-based attention concept that then has obviously triggered things like Transformer. Not everything obviously starts Transformer, there's there's always a history that is 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 important to recognize because then you can make sure that then those who might feel now, well, we don't have so much compute, you need to then help them optimize that the kind of research that might actually produce amazing change. Perhaps it's not as short term as some of these advancements, or perhaps it's a different time scale, but um the people and the diversity of the field is quite critical to, man to that we maintain it. And at times, especially mixed a bit with hype or other things, it's it's a bit tricky to be observing um, maybe too much of the same thinking across the board. Um, but the humans definitely are critical. And I can think of yeah quite a few personal examples where also someone told me something that had a huge, you know, huge effect on onto some idea. And then that's why I'm saying at least at the temp in terms of years, probably some things do happen. Yeah, it's fascinating. Like different, yeah. And it's also fascinating how constraints somehow are, are essential for innovation. Um, and the other thing you mentioned about engineering, I have a sneaking suspicion. Maybe I over, you know, my, my love is with engineering. So I have a sneaking suspicion that all the genius, a large percentage of the genius is in the tiny details of engineering. So like, I think I'll, we like to think our genius, our the genius is in the big ideas. There's, I have a sneaking suspicion that like, because I've seen the genius of details, of engineering details make, uh, like the, make the night and day difference. And I wonder if those kind of have a ripple effect over time. 
So that that too. So that's that's sort of the, taking the engineering perspective. That sometimes that quiet innovation at the level of an individual engineer, or maybe at the small scale of a few engineers, can make all the difference. That scales because we're doing we're working on computers that are scaled across large groups. That one engineering decision can lead to ripple effects. Yes, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean engineering. There's also kind of a historical, it might be a bit random, um, because if you think of the history of how, especially deep learning and neural networks took off, feels like a bit random because GPUs happened to be there at the right time for a different purpose, which was to play video games. Mm -hmm. So even the engineering that goes into the hardware um, and it might have a time, like the, the time frame might be very different. I mean, these the, the GPUs were evolved throughout many years where we didn't even were looking at that, right? So even at that level, right, the, that revolution, so to speak, um, the ripples are like, <laughs> like we'll see when they stop, right? But in terms of thinking of why is this happening, right? There's, there's, I think that when I try to categorize it in sort of things that might not be so obvious. I mean, clearly there's a hardware revolution. We are surfing thanks to that. Um, data centers as well. I mean, data centers are where, like, I mean, at Google, for instance, obviously they're serving Google, but there's also now thanks to that and to have built such amazing data centers, we can train these models. Um, software is an important one. I think um, if I look at the state of how I had to implement things to implement my ideas, how I discarded ideas yeah. because they were too hard to implement. Yeah, clearly the the times have changed and thankfully we are in a much better software position as well. And then, I mean, obviously there's research that happens at scale and more people enter the field. That's great to see, but it's almost enabled by these other things. And last but not least is also data, right? Curating data sets, labeling data sets, these benchmarks we, we think about. Maybe we'll we'll want to have all the benchmarks in one system, but it's still very valuable that someone put the thought and the time and the vision to build certain benchmarks. We've we've seen progress thanks to, but we're gonna repurpose the benchmarks. That's the beauty of Atari, is like we solved it in a way, but mm -hmm. We use it in Gato. It was critical, and I'm sure it's there's there's still a lot more to do thanks to that amazing benchmark that someone took the time to put. Even though at the time maybe, oh, you have to think what's the next, you know, uh, iteration of architectures. That's what maybe the field recognizes. But we need to. That's another thing we need to balance in terms of a humans behind. We need to recognize all these aspects because they're all critical, and we tend to, yeah, we tend to think of the genius, the scientist, and so on, but. I'm I'm glad you're. I know you have a strong engineering background. So, but also yeah. I'm a data. I'm a lover of data, and it, it's a pushback on the engineering comment. Ultimately, it could be the the creators of benchmarks who have the most impact. Andre Kapati, who you mentioned, has recently been talking a lot of trash about ImageNet, which he has the right to do because of how critical he is about image, uh, how essential he is to the development and the success of deep learning around. Uh, ImageNet, and you're saying that that's actually that benchmark is holding back the field, because I mean, especially in his context on Tesla Autopilot, mm -hmm. that's looking at real world behavior of a system. It's you, you. There's something fundamentally missing about ImageNet that doesn't capture the real worldness of things. That we need to have da data sets, benchmarks that have the unpredictability, the edge cases, the whatever the heck it is that makes the real world. So comp so difficult to operate in. We need to have benchmarks of that. So, but just to think about the impact of ImageNet as a benchmark, and that really puts a lot of emphasis on the importance of a benchmark, both sort of internally at DeepMind and as a community. So w one is coming in from within, like how do I create a benchmark for me to m mark and make progress, and how do I make a benchmark for the community yeah. to mark? and uh, push uh, uh, progress.